morning, everybody. Morning. Okay, before I start, uh, I uh, I wanted um, maybe to to thank everybody for attending this conference, and I also wanted to thank you for for organizing this uh, wonderful event. Um, in the continuing to think about these questions. Okay, so today I want to talk about something which now is joint work with the uh, words. And with Otto von Kurt in Korea. And uh, this is uh, probably going a little bit uh, off on a tangent, it's not so much related to the mainstream, but I thought it's maybe interesting. And this is uh, building on this notion that I introduced yesterday, it was the end of, uh, let me switch with respect to the planar case, Stark Seemann. So here, let me make a drawing. So those are systems uh, describing some particle moving in the plane under the influence of some forces. And we put uh, a singularity at the origin. So the, uh, the Hamiltonian of Q and P for a motion in the plane, so, so here's the motion Q of T of this particle, uh, will be given by P minus some vector potential square. Uh, so this is a vector potential and then plus some potential, uh, plus some potential energy where this potential energy will be minus 1 over Q, so there will be a Coulomb force uh, being generated by a charge sitting at the origin, um, and some additional potential, which is smooth. Okay. And, uh, and all this will be taking place on some subset of the complex plane. So let me say that's just a large enough subset U on which this potential V is smooth, which allows uh, the possibility of maybe having a second charge sitting somewhere here, but outside of the region that we're considering, so, 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 so that uh, the motion of the particle motion should take place in that region, yeah? <laughs> so the motion is never getting there, so, so then we can view this as a, as a smooth uh, potential. So this includes also the restricted three-body problem. If this is a second primary uh, and we're restricting two motions which are close to the first primary, which will be the case if the energy is sufficiently low, then the motion will be either near the, if it's below the first critical value, the motion will take place either near the first or the near the second primary. So it, then we can somehow put the potential generated by that one just into this next part to consider the motion here. Yeah, so, so this is uh, this will be one center Stark-Seemann systems. And uh, recently, in joint work with uh, with Lei Zhao, a colleague of us at Augsburg, uh, we extended uh, some of what I'm going to talk about also to two center. Uh, problems which would happen if in the restricted three body problem you go above the first critical value so you have motions which can really go around both the primaries and 
then things are getting more complicated, so I will restrict to the one center case to explain the main ideas. Um, so, so this would be the Hamiltonian and the, the, um, the Newtonian equations of motion generated by this Hamiltonian will come out to be uh, I times some magnetic field, uh, which in this case is just a scalar function, times uh, Q dot minus the gradient of the potential. Yeah? So, so this is the, uh, this is the, um, the curl of, of this potential. Yeah? So, so this is. Are you including the centrifugal force that you told yesterday? Yes, yeah, so, so, so this, this would be either the magnetic field If you interpret it in electromagnetic terms, or it will be the Coriolis force. Yeah. yeah. But the centrifugal. The centrifugal yeah. force will be in here. Okay. I mean, in, the, in, in here. Okay. Yeah. If we're coming from the restricted three body form, we have a centrifugal force. It will be part of the smooth potential. Okay. So so. In this class of systems, it's fairly general. We allow all such uh, forces in there. Yes, so this includes what I was mentioning yesterday. And now, now let's fix some energy value C, which is below the first critical value. So there is, there's also, for, you can look at this potential, and this will have some critical points and critical values. And let's say we are underneath the first uh, critical point. Then, then uh, let's denote by H inverse of C the corresponding energy level set. So the energy is preserved, the total energy, and uh, so the motion is taking place on that energy uh, level set. And I've discussed, I think, in the third lecture that you can, once you fix some energy, you can regularize the motion uh, on, on that, with that energy by, through the collision. So this can run into the origin, into a collision, but uh, you can do the Moser regularization of this energy. So uh, in the regularized uh, hypothesis, this is just a smooth uh, motion. Yeah? So Moser regularization. Let's call this sigma C. So this will be then the regularized hypersurface. Okay, so, so in there, the collisions have disappeared and everything just goes smoothly. So, so this is where the, uh, this is in phase space, so where both the positions and the momenta live. Now, we have a projection onto, well, onto the, the complex plane, just, just looking at what, what we're doing in position space, so, so as in this picture. And uh, let's, let's then denote by, uh, by the Hills region, which for some reason is called KC, which I never understood. Why not HC? Yeah, so, so this is, uh, this is so-called Hills. Region, so so this is all all the all the possible points on phase space on that and with that energy projected onto the position space. So this is all the points in position space which are uh, attainable by the motion of that given energy. Yeah, so so it will be so something inside you, but it might be smaller. Yeah, so so let's uh, so it would look like this. Yeah, so this would be the same region. So so then. If we're looking at motion of the dead, <laughs> I keep moving my phone. Yeah, so <laughs> actually here. Yeah. Okay. So 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 the, uh, okay. And now, now Q of T, we we look at the whole trajectory now, and we are interested in periodic trajectories. Uh, as was uh, said, it we're obsessed with periodic trajectories uh, ever since Poincaré. And uh, so so this 
trajectory, this point will start moving if you give an initial position a velocity, and it will do certain things, right? And the question is, what, what can it be doing, yeah? So here's, here's a typical motion that this article might discuss. Yeah? So, uh, First uh, result that uh, first proposition. So this curve is an immersion. So I want to have two statements. Q of T is an immersion. except for the following two phenomena. So immersion means uh, that it is moving at this point always with non-zero velocity. So, so at this point, this is a velocity vector, so the velocity vector is non-zero. If it's everywhere non-zero, we call this an immersion, mathematically. Yeah. But, but there's two exceptions which I drew in this picture. So the, the one possibility is that it, let me try this to my order, that it's cusped at the origin. So if, if it runs into a collision, and we're not excluding that, then in the Moser regularization, it's running in and it's bouncing back. Yeah? So in the, in, the, in the regularized hypersurface, this is just a smooth curve, but when you project it down onto position space, you see a cusp. Yeah? So it, and, so, and, and at this, this point, if you look at what it's doing in the position space, there's not an immersion, because at this point, uh, the velocity will be zero. Yeah? It will run there, it will stop, it will go back out. Yeah? Okay, so, so this is cusp at the origin, which corresponds to collisions. And the second phenomenon that can happen is that it's going to the boundary of the hills region. So for the hills region, you can, if, if you look at what, what does it mean, what, are the, what is the attainable region, because this is something which is positive plus the potential, the hills region is in fact given by all the Q such that V of Q is less or equal to C. Yeah? Because this is, uh, then, then you can choose it such as you make this term zero and that this is this. But, but then uh, uh, if V of Q is equal to C, then, uh, wait a second. Do you, do you gauge A to be zero at the origin? Um, Yeah, it's not it's not so it's not so apparent if I write it this form, okay? Um, it it will happen that when you're on the boundary of the hills region and you're at energy C, then in fact the velocity has to be zero. So the point is that here uh, the the momentum P is not Q dot. If you write Hamilton's equation then uh, then it's not P equals to Q dot, but P will be a combination of Q dot and A. Right, and, and if you unwrap it, you see that <laughs> you, could, you could alternatively write it, maybe it would have been better to write it as a Hamiltonian where I do not put the, the uh, magnetic potential, the vector potential in here, but I take a standard Hamiltonian, but I take the Hamiltonian vector field with respect to a different symplectic form. For symplectic geometry, this would have been maybe more natural. You are most recently writing a book about that, that you can incorporate a magnetic field into the symplectic form rather than into the Hamiltonian. Then it would have been p square, and you would see immediately that then the velocity and then the velocity is zero. Yeah. So so let me skip this. But it, when you work out the Hamiltonian equation, you see that on the boundary the velocity is in fact zero. So 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 then 
cusps on the, and we call it, therefore we call it also the zero velocity curve. is the boundary of the Hills region. Yeah. And there, the same thing happens. And uh, if, you, if you think about it, this is, uh, well, you, you think of, of a particle moving in a trough and, uh, and it's going uh, somewhere as up as it can be with its energy, and then the velocity becomes zero and it's going back down. Yeah? So this is, this is a phenomenon that you're seeing when you're hitting the boundary. OK, so, so, so this, uh, and now, When you can go a little bit further and think about what happens when we deform now the parameters of our system. So, so for, for a fixed uh, stax Lehmann system, we have some periodic orbit. Now, now let's assume that we are varying, for example, the masses in a restricted sea body problem, or we, we are varying the external magnetic electric fields, and we have for then we get a family of periodic orbits if we have a family of stax Lehmann systems. And suppose that, that in this family of periodic orbits, nothing terrible happens. They're not bifurcating or anything. They're just co continuing as a nice family of periodic orbits. And the question is, if you look at their projections, what will happen for these immersions? Uh, will in the family, will we, will we see uh, more drastic uh, singularities than in an individual curve? And uh, one can also work this out. So, so in a generic one-parameter family, of periodic orbits of stark Zeeman systems, following events occur. Let's draw some pictures. Let's start with one zero. So let's see if we have a singularity at the origin. How, how can it get resolved if we have one trajectory with a singularity at the origin? If we now vary the parameters, then we expect that this, this might go away. So this is the origin. And there's two ways to resolve this. So one possibility would be that it is just becoming smooth like this. And the other possibility is that it uh, develops a little loop like this. So those would be two possible ways to resolve this singularity. And uh, in a generic family of, of systems, when you look at the family of orbits, then you will, I mean, it would either go this way or it would go the other way. So, so this, this is what will happen, yeah? So, so when this is resolved, it's resolved in exactly this way. Okay. Likewise, Do you have to this yeah. no, this is a local analysis, yeah? We're interested in periodic orbits, say globally periodic, but this is just a local analysis of what happens near such a cusp. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, for this we don't. So the second possibility is this uh, what, uh, similar, similar thing happened at the uh, zero velocity curve. So, so here maybe I should draw the boundary of the, of the Hills region. And then we have a curve which is hitting the boundary like this. And then 
again, it can get resolved. No, I mean, yeah. so, so, and, and when you work it out, the local analysis, you will see also that it's getting resolved. So, so both of these are away from the boundary. So they are immersions where the velocity is never zero. And then from here, it can approach the boundary, you get attain a cusp, and then when you continue, it, you will see that it's uh, again moving away from the boundary, but in a different way where it has formed a little loop. Okay. Now, next, there's three more possibilities. So, two, two minus is it can so also something which would be, I didn't put in the drawing but for an individual curve it could happen that it is uh, touching itself so this is an immersion and uh, somewhere this is closing up somewhere it's coming back and this is closing up and uh, uh, well something this is yeah, yeah, this one, yeah, yeah, like this. So it's uh, touching itself. And then it, this can get resolved by either having this go away or by introducing intersection points. Yeah? Okay. Now, we can also draw the same picture by saying they, they come and they are going the same way. Yeah? This would be the move to plus. And now let's think about this picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you already wanted to protest. <laughs> this is not going to happen. This whole picture is not going to happen. Why? Because if we have such a self-tangent here for projection, then the position on, or at two different times agrees, and the velocities agree. Yeah? So, so, so then, the, then the two strands would have to be identical. So, so this simply doesn't exist. This, this cannot happen. This would have been a possibility a priori from the theory of immersed curves in the planes, but here it does not occur. This is using the fact that, that uh, the projection Q of T is solving a second order for D. And uh, the last one is the move three, which is if it's going through a triple point, This is perfectly allowable, that uh, it's not very, not generic, but it would, could have happened that that's coming three times through the same point, but at different velocities, that's fine, and then it could be resolved in uh, two different ways, yeah, either this way or the other way. Yeah? Okay, and this is uh, all that can happen. Before I continue describing what's happening, why are we interested in this question at all? Uh, this is also, going back to Poincaré or maybe even more to Birkhoff, uh, who were thinking of how to find periodic solutions in some complicated uh, uh, system. Like the restricted three-body problem can already be quite complicated. We do not understand the dynamics very well. So how do we find periodic orbits there? And it's completely useless to, to try and just try in different initial conditions and see whether it's closing up. I mean, you're never going to find a periodic orbit that way. So the way to find a periodic orbit would be to, to deform your, the system that you actually want to study, deform the parameters to some system that you understand very well. So, uh, I mentioned there's some limiting cases of the restricted three-body problem where you uh, uh, go, which, which are completely integral and which are very well understood. And I will mention maybe some, some of them. There's uh, the rotating Kepler problem, the Euler problem with two fixed centers, and there's some limiting cases which are integrable to which you can deform within this class of Stark-Zeman systems. D 
there you understand all the periodic orbits, and then you pick one of them. Now you deform your system back to the one you're interested in, and then see, then try to follow. If you want to do it numerically, try to numerically follow this these periodic orbits because you already know where to look, right? So so you you you're varying slightly your parameter, and then you know well you hope that very nearby you will find the periodic orbit, and then you have a chance of actually finding it. Once you find, you can go further and maybe follow and see that this periodic orbit will persist up to the moment where you reach your system that you're interested in. Right? So, so then we asked ourselves, okay, so it makes sense to study uh, one parameter families of periodic orbits in varying systems. And, and then we were thinking, okay, are there any invariants? Can we maybe a priori say that uh, if we start with a periodic orbit here, and we're looking for a periodic orbit there with certain characteristics, uh, uh, is it even conceivable that you can connect them or not? Maybe there's some obstruction that, that, uh, that in some system you cannot uh, connect it to an orbit which has certain characteristics if, uh, if here you have some other properties. And so, so we were looking for invariants of, uh, such, uh, of such periodic orbits which, and, and see how, which do not change under deformations. Now, at this, mo at this point, you might, one might remember something from, well, I, 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 I did remember something from my childhood when I, <laughs> or when my beginning university years. There, there is a, a wonderful book by Arnold from 90s, I guess, 94. And uh, this, uh, this was describing invariance of immersions in the plane. So, so that was a, it, it was called, I think, uh, immersed curves in the plane and and caustics or wavefronts or something, uh, the pollen. So, so he was precisely studying immersed curves and describing certain invariants, and uh, which may or may not change under these moves. So, for those of you who know knot theory, this is reminiscent of the Rydemeister moves one, two, three in knot theory. When you look at projections of, of knots in three space onto onto a plane, and you see what uh, in, in homotopies of knots what moves you see, then you see three types of moves: Rydemeister one, two, three. Here it's a little bit more complicated because this Rydemeister one move comes in two flavors, depending on whether you go into the origin, you go to the boundary of your uh, of your hills region, and uh, and also the Rydemeister two move comes in two flavors, where the self tangency is either in the same direction or in the opposite direction. And we've seen that one does not have. Yeah, that that will be important. In this. Uh, maybe before describing this invariance, let me mention one. One other result uh, which puts this into context is we can, so we've seen that if we have a family of stark systems, systems, then, and then families of periodic orbits undergo only these moves, nothing else. Now suppose we have a family of immersions in the plane undergoing only these moves. Then, in fact, we can construct a family of stark Weyman systems for which those are precisely periodic orbits. And so, so every... such uh, family of immersions arises as periodic orbits in a family of stark Weyman systems. Yeah. So so this is why we defined the class of stark Zeeman systems uh, rather generally. So, so we allowed arbitrary uh, scalar potentials V and vector potentials A of Q, so that uh, within that class, given some family of curves, we can fabricate a stark Zeeman system. So we, we just build by hand a potential and a vector potential such that uh, uh, the given curve is precisely the projection of a periodic solution of this. Stark Zeeman system. Yeah. 
kind of a fun exercise. And that's something I never did before, because usually the system is given and, uh, and you're trying to solve it. Now we start with a solution and build some <laughs> physical system that's having this as a solution. Yeah. But it was just, just, this is just a side remark. So, so, uh, so this is really precisely capturing orbits in, uh, in periodic orbits and stuff in our systems, these, these notions. Yeah. So, so then we, we also call those such families of curves uh, uh, Stark Zeeman homotopies. Now, what are, what are these invariants that Arnold found in the early 90s? Um, he found, in fact, several invariants uh, which, which do not change under some of those moves and which do change under some other of those moves. Now, from this uh, discussion, the interesting invariant for us is one which, which may change under this move because this move doesn't happen in our stark Riemann homotopies, but which should not change under the other moves. And there is precisely one of Arnold's invariants which has this property. So there exists an invariant that he calls J plus, So, so let me call K such a curve now. So, so it's just, just a projection of such a closed curve now. So because the, per the precise parameterization will not matter. It will be just, just the, 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 the picture of the curve will matter. So there's one which does. So, so this is taking values in the even integers, the way he normalizes it. Uh, which does not change under the moves to minus and three. Delta assigns some even integer to every such uh, curve here. So for this one, uh, if, if I were not so lazy, I could uh, try to compute this invariant. Yeah? Well, not quite. So, so this is invariant for honest immersions. Uh, now, in Arnold's picture, OK, I should say this, maybe. So this is, let me be slightly more precise. So these curves can have cusps. Now, but in this we see that generically cusps will not appear in a family, so we can resolve the cusp one way or the other. So, so let's first look at curves without cusps. So this is without cusps. So it's honest inversions. Yeah? So, so to every such immersion, you can associate a number. Now, now this, these two moves one here, they do not appear in Arnold because going from here to here is not through immersion. So Arnold is honestly starting immersions. And here you're going through a non-immersion. Yeah? So, so Arnold is not saying anything about how this is changing under this move. So that's something that we'll figure out now, how it's moving. So, but it is, so, so this is not yet giving us an invariant. So, so to get an invariant, we would say, OK, let's say if we see a cusp, we just resolve it this way or this way, and then we take the invariant. But then we better know that the invariant on this and this one is the same, right? Otherwise, we're not getting a well-defined invariant. Yeah. But then once once we can do that, then uh, if we can do it for those two moves, then it will not change under this one. Will not change under this one. It will change under this one, but we are not undergoing this move. So so we're good. Yeah. So let's uh, so let's take Arnold's invariant. 
and let's see how it's changing under those two moves, one zero and one infinity. For this, I just need to need to give you one more property of Arnold's invariant. The only thing we need we don't need anything else about the definition. We only need to know it's how, how it's changing under these three moves and how it is normalized on some stand, some collection of standard curves. So this is normalized. by the following values. So let's take, so there's a standard collection of immersions in the plane. Okay, so so for, for, for every uh, rotation number of the of the tangent vector. So the, here the tangent vector is rotation number zero, here the, the tangent vector is rotating once, here it's rotating twice, and so on it's rotating minus one, minus two. So for every rotation number we, we just pick one immersion and call those some standard immersion. So so this is uh, let's call this curve K0, K1, K2 and so on. And K minus one, K minus two and so on. And, and then the values of J plus on those curves is just some normalization because the rotation number is invariant under, homo, under homotopy through immersions. Yes? Um, I was thinking of yes. how find the rotation number in this case? Rotation number, you look at, uh, you look at the oh, tangent okay. vector and you go around the curve and you see how often it's rotating in the counterclockwise direction. Now this is so this is minus one. Yeah? Okay, so so now if you have if you choose a homotopy through immersions and you compute the rotation number, time it's not changing because it's continuous and it's an integer, so it cannot change. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so which means that uh, the, the class of immersions naturally uh, or the space of immersions naturally falls into connected components according to the rotation number, and we can normalize this invariant on each component separately. In principle, you could put arbitrary values here, but of course Arnold chose some nice values which give an additional nice properties. Yeah? So, and the normalization is this is normalized to zero, this is normalized to zero, normalized to zero, this is minus two, minus four, minus two, minus four. It's minus and minus. Okay? <laughs> So, so this invariant effect does not depend on the orientation of the curve. If you flip the orientation, this J plus invariant does not change. It's one of the properties it has. Um, okay. I want to uh, keep those pictures. No, well, those, those I can erase. Uh, I need to keep one zero and one plus because I want to compute how it's changing. one can prove a little lemma about the behavior of this invariant. So let me make a decent drawing here. Uh, Pick some component C, some component of the complex plane minus this curve. So, so I remove that curve from the complex plane, then I get many connected components. I take I take one of those. Yeah, it's one of those regions bounded by the curve. It's also pick one arc, we call it A, maybe. A, this is, this is some, some arc 
which is in the boundary of this component. Yeah? On the boundary, and which is oriented, the, this, our curves always go in a certain direction because this is trajectories of particles. Yeah? So, so this is oriented as boundary of this region C. So, so mathematicians orient the boundary of a region by saying that uh, when we approach the boundary, then we're going to the left. There's some, some convention one needs to be careful with to get the signs right. And now, this, this is a setting. And now, now let's change k by adding a little loop like this. The rest is unchanged, we're just adding a little loop, like this. And then, how does this invariant uh, J plus change? J plus of the new curve will be J plus of the old one. minus twice the winding number of k around the component c. So this is the winding number. Of k around a point in c. You pick any point here. And then you look from this point, you start somewhere, and you look at the difference vector to, from here to a point on the curve. And then you move along the curve, and you always watch the, the difference vector to this point, and you count how often it is rotating. Counterclockwise. Gives you some integer. Yeah. Call this the winding number to distinguish it from the rotation number, which is a different thing. The rotation number concerns the tangent vector to the curve itself. Now here it is a, it's a different vector between the point on the curve and some fixed. And, and if you choose a point in some other component, this winding number will in general be different. Yeah? Well, because it does not depend in that component which point I take. Because you yeah, are taking this point and taking that point, that number will be the same. Yeah? Because you can somehow homotope one to the other. Right. So now uh, from this, we can now compute the change under I zero and I infinity. Namely, consequences. First one, J plus does not change under I infinity. Why not? Because if we if we look at I infinity, what is the setup here? So uh, so here we're looking at the original curve. We are having some. Let me try to use the same color coding. So we are from here to here. We are adding a loop in which component, where's the component C, which is on the outside of the curve. So, so this curve is closing up somewhere. Yes? Right? But the whole curve is lying inside of this Hills region. So this component, when I'm going to, the, to this side of the curve, this is the unbounded component, which is going out to infinity, which is the outside of the curve. And I'm adding from here to here, I'm adding this loop in, in this component, uh, if I compare with, with, with that picture. Yeah. yeah? Okay. okay so, so that picture could also be applied when, it, when, it's, uh, when it's the unbounded component on the outside. The same, the same regard, yeah? I, uh, I don't have to assume it's a bounded component. C uh, could also be this component, which is the exterior one, then the same thing holds. But if, uh, but if C, rather than this one, if C is this outside, Component, then the winding number uh, of k around the point, that component is zero. Yeah. 
Yeah, because if you have a point in this component, you can move it very far to infinity, and then uh, basically the difference vector is not is not uh, varying. Yeah, so so it's not making any rotations. Ah, so the consequence is that the J plus does not change if you add. Uh, it does not change if I add this little uh, this little loop at the outside. Then it doesn't change. Yeah, it changes if I add little loops somewhere in the inside, mm -hmm. but at the outside it doesn't change. It's a, it's a special case. Yeah? And that's exactly what's happening in, in this move. Yeah. So there, so that's easy. So there it doesn't change, which is good. Uh, now, for the one zero, uh, that's of course not true. Because now, now this, uh, well, there, there's, there's a component which is containing the origin. Yeah? So, so the, the curve generically does not go through the origin. Then I have this component C which is containing the origin. And then we're adding a little loop on that component. So it will change by the winding number of K around the origin. Yeah? So here, under 1, 0, we will have that uh, J plus will change to, well, let's say J plus of K prime is J plus of K. What? Minus twice the winding number of, now literally be a little bit careful, it's not the winding number of K around the origin. But it's the winding. Okay. So this is k. The winding number of k around the origin would be if I put the origin here. Then I would measure the winding number of k around the origin. If I put the origin on this side, it differs from the winding number of k around the origin by plus or minus one. You work out that it's, it's actually the winding number of k around the origin. So let me call this. W0, the winding number around the origin. Uh, and then if this one plus one, if you work it out. So, so it's, it's off by one. Yeah, if, the, if, if in this picture the origin were here, then this would be the winding number around the origin. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but because we're here, if we, go, if we cross once, then this winding number will change by plus or minus one, and the work is changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so now I can uh, now we can erase because from this we can now compute the. So the bad news is that uh, the J plus is not invariant. Yeah, it's changing. It's actually changing. But we know uh, it's it's changing. Uh, we can describe the change in terms of a winding number around the origin. Now, being a physicist, then you're quite happy, yeah, because you all the time you have quantity that you want to be invariant, but they're changing, but they're changing along with some other quantity, and then you just use this other quantity to to compensate the change, right? Because also, you see, a little bit too early. Okay. Now, the winding number around the origin going from k to k prime is also changing. Okay, now, I, okay, let me redo it here. So, so we had k here, which is going past the origin like this. And then we had k prime where, uh, where we have added a little loop around this. Okay, let me, let me, let me. Look at the picture like this. Sorry. Yeah. And then, then the winding number of k prime is the winding number of k plus two, if you work it out. Because you're first of all you you're going from here to there. If you if it's just going past like this, it would have increased already. I wonder. Then you make another change. So so anyway, it, it's it's uh, it's increasing by two. Yeah. So the the winding number around the origin and is the winding number plus two. 
So now we have two quantities going from k to k prime which both change and then some combination of those two quantities will be unchanged. Yeah? So now that's a computation which I'm not going to make from this. Now we define an invariant uh, which we call J1 of k which we define as J plus of k plus the winding number of k squared over 2. This does not change under. Should I do the computation? I think <laughs> you can do it yourself, right? I mean, now you have all the greedy, you know how both of them change. Now you compute this quantity and see that the change is just offset. Yeah? Questions? Not that I know, and we can discuss later whether this has some physical interpretation. That's basically the question, right? And I don't know. I mean, at that point, we were just doing mathematics, trying to find invariant of, of, of these words. So, but we, let's, let's discuss afterwards. Yeah. Maybe it has some physical meaning. Let me maybe, maybe just wrap up this discussion. So, so this is invariant under this change, and and because. This was already invariant under all the other moves that we can undergo, and, and also this winding number is not changing under any of the other moves. So, so it's invariant under all the moves. So it's invariant under uh, Staatsehemann homotopies. Okay. Now, because I don't have much time, let me just mentioned without going into details, you can define a second invariant. Which is also invariant under stark lehmann homotopies. Which we call J plus, J, J, J2 of K by taking the, the pre-image of K under the Levi-Civita regularization method. Which was the map, uh, I think I had called it phi, from the complex plane to the complex plane, which is just mapping Z to Z square. I had shown that if you pull back the Hamilton, if you take that map, you compute its cotangent lift, you pull back the Hamiltonian is becoming non-singular. This and gives you the Levi-Civita regularization. Now let's take this map and, and pull back, take the pre-image of, of, of our curve K under this 2 to 1 covering. Then depending on whether the winding number around the origin is even or odd, the pre-image will have one connected component or two. If it has one, then take that and take the J plus invariant of that. If it has two components, just choose one and take its J plus invariant. It actually does not depend on which one you choose. Something to be checked. So, so this way you can define the second invariant. And when, when that, that was Ursus' idea. So, so I think the first invariant we came up with together. And uh, then uh, I was happy with that. And then we said, well, there's a second one. We can take this pre image under Levitian and set with. But it's ridiculous. It's not going to give you anything new. Fine. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I, my guess was this would just be expressible in terms of the first one. And, um, well, but was it existed, so okay, let's go along and let's see where it leads us, yeah, um, waste our time. And then uh, uh, it, it turns out that uh, <laughs> I think we were both half right, yeah? So, so in half the cases it is, and in half the 
if they didn't, so, so that's maybe the last <laughs> result uh, that I want to state. It's, uh, this is the third proposition. I'm not going to say anything about the proof. It's uh, A, if the winding number of K around the origin is odd, then J2 of K is twice J1 of K minus 1. Okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's what I expected. Yeah, so it's expressible in terms of the first one. Uh, but if, if the winding number is even, then the pair J1 of K, comma, J2 of K attains all values in the even integers times the even integers. So, uh, uh, may one, one comment, depending on the parity, this invariant, this event, J. J1 and J2, they could be even or odd, and it depends on the parities. Yes, so, so you see that in this case, the J2 is automatically odd, and it's determined by J1. Now, in this case, they, they both turn out to be even. So, uh, they can only attain even, even values, but they attain all even values, so they're completely independent. Yes, so you can fix uh, J1, but then J2 can still attain all even integer values. So, so it is really giving you additional information. And then, okay, so, and then uh, towards applications of this, uh, a uh, PhD student, of course, did some computation with Song Chan Ping. And uh, he computed the, the, the invariance. J1 and J2 for all periodic orbits in two limiting systems of the restricted three-body problem. One is the rotating Kepler problem. You are having just one primary and the second one moving around it under the uh, gravitational refraction, but you're switching to a rotating coordinate system. So, physically, it's a kind of ridiculous thing to do, yeah? But, <laughs> but uh, we've seen that to, to study the three-body problem, the circular planar three-body problem, we want to switch to this rotating coordinate system. So, basically, there as a starting point, we want to take the Kepler problem and switch to rotating coordinate system, and then add a second primary, yeah? So, let's suppose we do that, but we do not add the second primary. We just look at the Kepler problem, but in a rotating system. Of course, the system is physically equivalent, but, but mathematically it is not, because you have added now a Coriolis force and a, and a centrifugal force, and in, that, in those rotating coordinates, for example, in a, a motion which was periodic in the Kepler problem, if you have a Kepler, a Kepler ellipse, which is periodic, you go into these co rotating coordinates, it may not be periodic. Yeah? It may or may not be periodic. So, uh, because, because there's a second period, you artificially add it, uh, a second period, which is the period of rotation, which is completely unrelated to, to the system, yeah, uh, to it, and and only if those two periods are rationally dependent would would the, the thing close up, and otherwise it would not, yeah. So the system is actually coming out different, yeah. So this is the rotating Kepler problem, but it's still a completely integrable system, and and the other one is the Euler problem of two fixed. Centers. So here you are, you do have two uh, primaries, but they are not moving about each other on capillary analysis. But you just fix them in space. Now, don't ask me physically how you would realize such thing. But suppose we have two protons and they're just somehow being fixed in space for some reason, and then you have an electron moving in the field generated by that. That would be the system, which is also a limiting case. 
which is also completely integral, and you can work out all the periodic orbits. And those of the periodic orbits here and periodic orbits there, they are in nice one-to-one -one correspondence, and, you, and he computed their two invariants. It turns out the two invariants are all the same. So it, so it is conceivable that in the class of stark zeeman systems, here you have uh, the Euler and the rotating Kepler problem. Now you can connect them through a family of stark zeeman systems where in the middle there are some interesting cases of the, of the uh, restricted three-body problem. It's possible that all the periodic orbits from here, they, they persist all the way and go through, yeah? Actually, initially, Fermitian had computed that, uh, that half of the orbits have different invariants, which I found much more interesting, because it would say that if you start with these orbits here, and you connect that in between, something would have to happen. You would have to undergo some bifurcations of periodic orbits. Uh, I, I found that much more interesting. Uh, then uh, he recently wrote us an email that his initial com computation was wrong and they actually all equal. So uh, now, now Urs says it's maybe good news if you actually want to find periodic orbits because then it, it gives you maybe more hope that... And, and I find this an intriguing question, yeah? So, so we have uh, infinitely many periodic orbits on both sides, but they look quite different. And you can connect them now through systems which you don't completely don't understand, and at least these numerical computations suggest it might be possible that they actually all persist throughout uh, this whole homotopy. I don't believe they do, but Urs does. Uh, it would be interesting to have somebody maybe do some numerics and see whether one can actually follow along. Yeah, so, so what we're doing is really just try to find some restrictions on what can or what cannot be possible. We're not really finding periodic orbits, but at least this suggests it might be. Yes, for, so for the initial systems, they are almost non-degenerate. I mean, they are they, they do come in in they 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 lie. It's a completely integrable system. So, and of in two degrees of freedom. So it, the phase space is foliated by two-dimensional tori, mm -hmm. for which you have linear motion. Mm -hmm. So on some of them, the motion is irrational and stuff close. And then when it's rational then they all close up, so they're not quite non-degenerate, but they come in a one-dimensional family of periodic orbits, but it's, we call it more spot okay, yeah, non-degenerate. Yeah, so, so it's almost as good as being non-degenerate. Uh, and and we, kind of have, we have an idea, like such a more spot family, how it will break up when you vary a little bit. Yeah, It's a circle family that you expect it to break up into two orbits, mm -hmm. which are non-degenerates. And, and one, can, one can do that. One can perturb it a little bit and see this Actually, that's what Songchan did. He did not directly work with the Mossbot family, but he perturbed very slightly and then took what he gets. Okay. And then they are non-degenerate. Mm -hmm. yeah? so, so you could hope that maybe they remain non-degenerate all the time and then they would nicely persist. Yeah? But, but, yeah, that would be the ideal situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I guess curiosity, you said there's a correspondence between the periodic orbits of this rotating capital yeah. problem and the two centers. Yes. Oh. It's not obvious. They're so different. They're so different. Yes, it's not obvious. Well, how, how did you get that? Okay. Can you explain it to us? <laughs> well, you're still. So you. Uh, uh, so in the interrogating capital problem, you have uh, two prominent periodic orbits. So these are the um, yeah. direct and retrograde. Yes. So they are circles. And in the Euler problem, you have also two prominent periodic orbits, which look but if you look at the bifurcations, they co completely correspond to each other. So, so Aristotle's will be completely shocked. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was it the other problem? They're collisions from the outside, like this? Uh, uh, you, you have one component, so you can co collide. You can collide. Uh, uh, yeah, you in one collide from the left, or you can collide from yeah, the right. So, so those three. Yeah. They go, they go to the zero velocity curve. Yes. Turn back, run into collision, bounce back. Go on. That's the infinity velocity. Yeah. The, the velocity but, but, they're, but, they're, but they're regular, right? Yeah. They're so, 
So the regularized curves are nice and smooth. Yeah? The velocity and the collision is um, it's zero it's in it's our, after our regularization. <laughs> We're, we're changing the time parameterization. Yeah, physically, of course, it would be infinity, but we're changing time parameterization. So, so, yeah, so, so those would be the two, and they correspond in the, in the rotating Kepler. We only have one primary, but we're in rotating coordinates. But still, you will find circular orbits going either this way or going the other way. Correct, those? Those would be the direct and retrograde. Can you find a homeomorphism connecting the two after regularization, etc., or some sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, but, but that should, um, because the, the whole bifurcation is so. But so this, there is a homeomorphism between these two, so it's amazing, really it's amazing. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good question. I want to thank Kai for his wonderful lecture, of course. Fifteen minute break. Fifteen. Fifteen. Short. Yeah.